Argo, Tilray, and Twitter. Positions we're interested in and have some interest in our work. So we have two things that are going on. You'll notice there is pivots and uh, a couple things on Thinkorswim. Do we have any Thinkorswim clients here? Great, because uh, apparently the title originally was my top three favorite indicators on Thinkorswim, but since um, it's a delta neutral event, we can't be promoting just one platform. But um, my name's John Person. Thank you all for being here. We had a little bit of a just fun camaraderie, joking around, boring as hell to present. It's technical analysis, it's trading. It can be stressful once you become numb to the uh, uh, effects of trading, and that's what we should do, be numb, not emotional, right? And that sometimes is hard to do. So if you're managing money, which I have a small little fund I run, J Person Asset Management, uh, we also started a little thing on this product that they've probably been talking about here at the Expo called Collective Two. It's called Quantrader. Uh, since December, we did this. It trades off of VIX, VXX. Uh, it went from zero because there's guys that have been there a long time to I think I'm ranked number 25 out of 2,000 or whatever the number is. So up 11.9% in uh, that uh, trade strategy that we run there, and it's basically off the VXX. So um, there's several different things that I do. I've uh, been trading in the markets since 1982 was my actual first trade. I started as a runner when I was 16 at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, I worked with a guy by the name of George Lane who created an indicator called Stochastic. So I have been around the field of technical analysis for too long. I was voted into this organization called APTA, which is the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, which means I get a plaque and paid dues and you know, I, I get to pay into the thing. It's kind of like a CMT thing, but anyway, you get voted in. So there's about 150 or 70 of us in that, and you've heard probably a few speakers here. I think Ralph refused to do it because he's, you know, Ralph Acampora, uh, part of, you know, helped create and found the Market Technicians Association, now the CMT. So anyway, it, it means I'm just a geek on technical analysis, right? So if you want to throw something out at me, I've either seen it, played with it, tried it, lost money with it, or if you don't see that I use it, then that's the truth, right? If you see me using something, it's because that's what I use. So what do I use and what do I help to formulate a trade, a trade idea, and that is the question and the topic for today's session, if that's all right with you guys. So what are my favorite tools? What are the algo strategies, kind of how I develop these? And the answer is it depends on the product. It always depends on the product. It's if futures, I'm looking at just a simple momentum trade, right? Um, if it's an ETF or a stock, it's, I generally never trade day trade stocks. I don't day trade ETFs because you generally get a little bit more. I'm not a big earnings player. I may hold a position into earnings if I've got an edge on it. If I have a trade and it looks iffy, I cut it before an earnings. As you know, earnings recently, stocks that are doing well, like a Microsoft, might be up to three, maybe three and a half percent. Stocks that don't do well, down 15, 20 percent, like we just saw with CSX, and we see really bad looking things happen to stocks that are maybe in a, in a, a bad, value position is what I like to call it. There's a tool that I created. I didn't invent the concept. It's called relative strength. And basically you compare a percent change movement of one instrument to a benchmark. So you hear a lot of people and I will say what it is. On CNBC, if you watch CNBC and in this day and age, unfortunately, you have to watch CNBC for breaking news or you have to have some kind of a news feed because we have dynamic fluid events that cause market gyrations, namely presidents who tweet. So while many of you know, jokingly, I am no longer a Democrat, I voted for the guy, I caused a lot of volatility, I sometimes do not appreciate the times of day that those tweets come out. So it causes a little bit of a headache. So I'm just being real. Uh, this is what happens to you as a trader. I don't really care who's in president. They don't come to my house for dinner. I don't go to their house for dinner. So, you know, it, it's not really anything that's going to affect my life. But what does affect my life are what policies are, are 
enacted, and um, that's, that's a whole different story. What I need to be concerned is, and what I do is I look at the macro event of a market. So I look at if I'm going to be with a general dynamic trend, I want to be more as a position trader or a swing trader going with that trend. So what are the tools that help me in the stock market to determine a strengthening trend? Who wants to ask that question? Nobody. Good. So I'll answer it for you. The first one that I use for when it comes to stocks, okay, well, we won't be looking at that and encountered a problem. Um, the first one I look at is advanced decline analysis. Advanced decline analysis, as I gave in a prior presentation, if you look at this middle chart, it's now out of focus, but it's a day trade page. If you look at the charts on your left, again, five minute chart on the E-mini S&P, at the bottom is a 15 minute chart on the E-mini S&Ps, two different time frames. And in the middle, this is the spider, S&P, the spider. What we did is break down the advancers versus the decliners. So, and then there's a line underneath that has a cumulative line, the cumulative ratio. So if I'm trading in the S&P 500 and we have a chart, which it just went down naturally for um, Murphy's Law, we break down and can look at the advanced decline of the top stock indices that I trade. So instead of looking at an advanced decline of just the NYSE, which is the New York Stock Exchange, if you've heard people talk about breadth of the market, and they say the advancers versus the decliners, and on CNBC, Bob Pisani might talk a lot about that, right? How many people have heard that? Use that. Do you know what it is? It shows you how many stocks are up versus how many stocks are down. But that advanced decline is on the NYSE, an index that none of us are really trading. We can, and people do, and other institutions can take the advanced decline and take a look at, as I've done, the top stock indices. So there's 30 stocks in the Dow. We have an advanced decline on the Dow. There's the advanced decline on the Qs, which is the NASDAQ 100, the S&Ps, the Russell, the NASDAQ composite. And some people actually take a breakdown of the advanced decline of individual subsectors. So whether it's transportation, and they can get really down and dirty and break down those uh, subsectors into sub sub -sect sectors and go from rails, um, truckers, and airlines, and even shipping. So there's, there's really a, a focus of getting under the, um, the hood, so to speak, of what the strength of the overall market is. I like to teach this because it makes a lot of logical sense and it saved my ass from making a lot of stupid mistakes because me as a human being, there's a lot of times where I feel that this market can't go any higher and it's due to sell off. But yet, I look at the advanced decline and it's breaking out making new highs, and yet I look at little things like maybe the transports, the IYT had a bad day, but all stocks were not down. The more stocks that go up and in the advanced decline, when the breadth of the market's rising, it shows there's strong participation in the market. So even for day trading, one of the things that I always want to focus in on is watching that breadth of the market. And if I'm day trading E-mini S&Ps, the last thing I want to look at is what the breadth is doing in the Russell. So that's why on your screen for day trading pages, we have, a, through TradeStation, I'm capable of breaking down the advance and decliners on the S&Ps. So we left today, which I do apologize for this technical glitch. Um, but it, it was probably, let's see, uh, we left the day probably 386 positive versus 114 negative. And I'm guessing that because you can see 114. If there's 503 stocks, there might be a couple unchanged. Today, we left 114 stocks negative on the day. That means literally over 75%, 80% of the stock market was positive today in the S&P 500. What I'm looking at is what are the negative sectors? So I'm going to put together a little fundamental backdrop. The market and experts and people that manage trillions of dollars think there was a recession coming after the whole Trump-China war thing was going on in what, late March, early April. Agree? More or less, right? Isn't that what we're all worried about? The Fed needs to lower interest rates. There's no stimulus, blah, blah, blah. Student body left money management, went into defensive sectors. 
What's a defensive sector? Something that pays me an interest. I'm not looking for active growth. I'm not putting my money to work into high flying stocks. I'm going to put it into something really calm, cool, collective, something that pays a dividend like utilities. I'm going to put it into stuff like maybe consumer staples. I'm going to put it into stuff like maybe real estate investment trust, something that pays a dividend return. I'm going to put it into bonds, TLT. So those are called non-cyclical. They are defensive sectors. So if we start to see money flow going into aggressive stuff, semiconductors, transportation stocks, my best discretionary stock sector to watch on the planet all time is Las Vegas. If you have enough money to pay your rent, pay your water bill, make your wife happy, jump on a plane, fly out to Vegas, and Vegas is reporting profits not from casino operation, but from room rates and entertainment, that's a good consumer discretionary indication that the economy is not going down. How many people think that's true? That pretty much makes sense, right? A consumer staple like uh, Philip Morris, which got rewarded greatly, it's a sin, I guess you want to call it a, a sin company. What is it? They sell cigarettes, right? So good times, bad times, they always used to tell me people smoke and people drink. So that's not a good gauge of strength of the market. In the industrial sector, I'm going to give you another one to watch as a harbinger. Illinois Tool Works, ITW. I've been writing about this, talking about this for a few years. And that's, by the way, right? A little Democrat, a little plug for you guys. <laughs> Not all Democrats are criminals. Just ask Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> joke. It was a joke. I'm making a funny face. For those that aren't joining us here, that was a joke. Anyway, Illinois Tool Works. Um, you know, a lot of people look at Caterpillar. They look at John Deere. They look at those industrials, and they forget some of the other little ones that are under the radar screen. So if you, you know, there's a couple staple little areas of the market that I like to kind of take a look at as a group, and those are them to get a good gauge of the market because I can't believe a thing that comes out of A, the media's mouth, I never have, and it isn't because of the last two years, it's because the media does nothing but promote bad news because that's what sells, gets your attention. You know, it's an earthquake, it's a snowstorm in Chicago. Holy God, you're sitting here listening to the news. There's a snowstorm in Chicago. So you call up and say, hey, what's the, you know, is someone going to shovel the driveway? What are you talking about? There's an inch of snow up here, right? A, but, but the news says there's a blizzard down here. You guys are snowed in, right? I mean, that's the media. And I'm not being funny. That's the truth. You should see the reports that we get down in Florida. Where in Florida do you live? North Florida. What part? Uh, Ponte Vedra. Ponte Vedra. Oh, good golf up there, man. All right. You golfer? Good man. All right, so the presentation today is about trading, and I think that one of the things that we have to do is exclude noise. There's a lot of noise. Sometimes indicators can present us noise. I want to go back on, and before we get into the hardcore presentation and just share with you what helps me filter out noise in this graph. If I have the S&Ps, now if you join me at the CME, and I'm sorry you had to go, and I know you're catching a flight to India, thank you very much. Thank you. If you're trading the S&Ps, and you're looking at a day trade, what's the difference, what is the S&Ps trade off? The value of cash market, right? What is the cash index, the S&Ps trade off? How do they get their value? By the valuation of stocks, right? So wouldn't a, one of the best day trading or true gauges of market value not be by looking at S&P's futures trading, but by the health of what the cash market is doing? Now that's, that's a sign that we're not making any more political jokes. That was the sign, no more political jokes. It was about focus in on the business at hand. That was the sign, I think. All right? The lights just went down for those that aren't here. Um, all right. So that's one of the reasons that the difference in the futures is people may place an order. The market may trigger a few stop-loss orders. The futures may see a couple down ticks. Meanwhile, the cash spiders are upticking, and the breadth, the advancers, are starting to uptick. 
Well, that little down tick, if you're just watching the futures, you think, oh, wow, market might be going down. I got to get short. And you actually got caught in maybe a quick algorithm squeeze or, you know, someone triggered some stops. So if you, before you look at the actual futures to see if they're really a bona fide sell signal, look to see if you've got a corresponding sell signal in the cash market. So that's the logic behind why I have a five minute E-mini S&P chart in the upper left corner and the five minute spider with the breakdown of the advancers and decliners. How does that sound? Right? And then there's this volume tool and that's a, another, a story for another day. So what I talked about earlier today was this, what I call this is a, a very old slide. I think this was created in 2000, I'm not joking, I think 2008. So talk about not having to do the work over twice, right? So I got a lot of mileage out of this. This is something that I have, which if you use Thinkorswim, you get this unbelievable tool. It's a momentum price indicator. It's called Person's Pivot Study, PPS. And I will give Tom Sosnoff credit for it because he's the one when he ran Thinkorswim, he's the one that said, I like that indicator, I want it on toss, what do you call it? I go, it's a momentum price bullish bearish indicator. He goes, it's too long, let's call it PPS. And I don't know why that? He goes, person's pivot study, but it's not a pivot point study. He goes, I don't care, I like it, PPS. I said, okay, so I'm not gonna argue with the 800 pound gorilla in the room, right? So sure, Tom, you're gonna have that, that's what we got. So that's what's on Thinkorswim. This is also on a product we, we use, Trade Navigator, Genesis, and again on TradeStation. Candle patterns. I wrote a book 15, 16 years ago. Candles and pivot point, trading triggers. I helped popularize what a doji was. The high close and the low close doji are incredible chart patterns. They're not morning, morning star or evening star patterns. They're momentum studies that come after downtrends. You see a doji within X amount of bars. If the market closes greater than the high of that doji, it generates a momentum reversal. We scan for that. We created scans for that. And for stock traders, we look for that not just for weekly, a daily, but weekly time frames. So a lot of stocks during the week, a lot of traders miss looking at their higher time frame charts like weeklies. So that's one of the patterns. So person's pivots is another indicator which many of you are familiar with. If you're not familiar with the person's pivot indicator, there's these brochures up here, guys, that you can take one and it tells you all a little bit about the person's pivot and the actual formula. It's right here in this little booklet. There's not a whole lot left, but first come, first serve up what's, what is left. I look at chart patterns. I absolutely look at seasonals. Um, I helped a guy by the name of, you're probably familiar with him, uh, the Stock Traders Almanac. We started a product called the Commodity Traders Almanac. And the work that I did there was I said, listen, there's about 20,000 people trading commodities. There's 30 million people trading stocks. Um, I'm trading more stocks and less commodities. And I see a correlation with a lot of stocks that correlate heavily to seasonal trends of the commodity market. So like John Deere, and uh, CF, Mosaic, and some of the ag sector fertilizer companies, they actually have a strong seasonality that corresponds with the grain complex, by the way. Obviously, you look at the energy complex. You look at uh, whether it's the oil and gas exploration or the oil service sector. There's a little difference between the stocks and those two separate um, subsectors of energy. They do correlate well with crude oil. So the Commodity Traders Almanac defined the seasonality of commodities and commodity-based stocks. That's where we got the work. I introduced saying, hey, I, I'm an ex-bond trader. You know, there's a strong seasonality. Let's introduce bonds to the season, uh, uh, seasonal commodity trend. So we do focus on seasonality. And as a commodity trader, when I first got my, my, my opportunities in Chicago, I mean, if you didn't understand uh, you know, rain makes grain, and if you didn't understand knee high by the 4th of July, because back in 1980, we didn't have the E-mini S&Ps. We had currencies, we had uh, the meats, we had grains, we did have the bonds, we had gold, lumber, whoa, there's a big one, right? And they did have, believe it or not, butter, and they still have, I think, butter futures. I don't think they delisted that. They had pork bellies, which incidentally, has been delisted for many years. No more pork bellies. So if you watch Trading Places, 
and they say pork bellies. Hmm, pork bellies. I feel something's happening in the pork belly market this morning, right? If you remember Winthorpe, right? Well, they don't trade pork bellies anymore. Sad to see that contract go. Well, there's other forms of analysis that we put together, and one is called relative strength, RSI, and that's the point I was going to make a few minutes ago about on now the financial media. It seems that everyone says, look at the relative strength of XYZ stock to the overall market, right? Have you been hearing a lot of people talk about that recently? There's a tool that I created called the PMC indicator. You can find it on TOS if you're a TOS player uh, user. And um, what it does is it gives us a ratio measurement in terms of percent change and the momentum versus the S&P 500 in a graphical depiction. And I'm going to go through that with you today. So let's, and then finally, I guess there's a couple other things for stock traders. We have the breadth of the market, which I just went into a little bit of detail. For commodities, we have another really powerful tool that gives us a contrarian consensus indicator, and it's called commitment of traders data. And that gives us a breakdown without every one of these bullet points I could spend a, a few hours talking about and teaching you the ins and outs of. So I just wanted to scratch the surface of what I go into and use. Now, would I use the COT data to measure Apple versus the S&P 500? No, I would use a relative strength. Would I use the COT data to see what the strength is of gold maybe? Yes. Or crude oil? Absolutely, because those are commodity-based markets. Or currencies. If I see that in even the E-mini S&Ps, if I see that the small speculators are heavily short, which generally they don't have a good history. And we can visually back test that and you can see the results. Incidentally, the stock market's up today. I'm gonna bet a lot of people thought it was gonna go down after Friday's little sell-off. And the market is kind of teetering against the new high breakout in its breadth, advanced decline. And here's another kicker. Small speculators are short E-mini S&Ps, net short. So what do you think? A group that's generally wrong and they're short the market, here's how we use that tool. It's called threshold of pain. This sounds bad, it sounds derogatory, but it's actually an indicator that a few hedge funds have put together. They have done a historical study on what it takes for someone to AKA, otherwise known as blow out of the market. What is the threshold of pain for a small speculator to say, I'm wrong, get me out, before he maybe A, loses all the money in his account or wires money in? Is it, if the margin requirement on an E-mini S&P is $6,000, and if the average size commodity account's somewhere around 15,000, they estimate. Commodities are like potato chips, no one ever just does one. So if you're in two contracts, so it's a 12,000 initial margin to hold a position overnight, and you have 15,000 in your account, at what point is the threshold of pain that you're wrong that you get blown out at? And the answer was figured out at around 70 to 80% of the initial margin. So if someone blows out around five grand, first off, you're on an initial margin call. But second off, that's about the point where people say no more, no mas. So that's about the threshold of pain. So think about what I don't want to embarrass anyone in this session. But think about yourselves if you traded futures, at what point were you wrong? And what would be nice is to, to pull that information together, not to embarrass anyone, but to pull that information to say, hey, guess what? It's probably about, if you had a $6,000 margin at $4,000, $5,000, that's when you throw your towel in. How many people would raise your hand and say, yeah, that's about what I've done in the past, or that's what I would do, right? And then you're done and you got to reload and then you got it over your ego and you get over the, the insult and after you clean the salt out of your wounds, right? But if you think about it, a couple people were courageous enough to raise their hands. And I'm not doing this to embarrass anyone, like I said. I'm doing this so that you could see you're not alone. And that's the power. The power is to understand you weren't alone. You're not alone. Everyone else does that. And these hedge funds have figured that out. So from where the average short of the market is figured out, what would it take before the market may exceed that blow off or blow out point? That's about what they estimate might give them a higher degree of confidence if they're long to liquidate their longs. Does that make sense? Because this is actually a, an algorithm that was created. Just saying what's out there. 
I'm not saying it's 100% efficient, but it's another aspect of psychological. How can you find the commitment at traders data if you're not familiar with it? I find it to be so useful if you, uh, so sh I could show you real briefly. We go to Persons Planet, this is my website. And if you go to where it says resources, at the very first top it says COT data. You click one click, pop-up box didn't happen, I'm not asking for your firstborn or your credit card, and a little thing that says get report, click on it, get report. Wow, one click. Scroll down until you find your listing, and the problem with COT is you have to find what exchange that product is traded on. So the, the E-mini S&Ps are traded at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So click, I like to use futures and futures options combined. So I, because I think if someone's got a futures on, that's one thing, but they also could have an option strategy on. So I'm using this as a con, kind of a contrarian opinion. I wanna know what the net position is of the small speculator. Now, I use this technique solely in E-mini S&Ps because this is the one that small speculators are really attracted to. You don't find a lot of small speculators trading oat futures. You don't see a lot of small speculators trading soybeans day in and day out. You don't find a lot of small speculators trading 30-year treasury bonds, but they are in E-mini S&Ps, okay? So there's... Excuse me? You mean the NASDAQ? A lot of people, small speculators aren't really as involved in the NASDAQ, so I don't trust it. I'm just telling you my observations with the ES, the E-mini S&Ps. If you scroll down and you get to S&P 500, about three quarters of the way down, then you'll find E-mini S&Ps, the open interest is 3,497. You'll notice that they're long 300,000 versus short 350,000. Last week, as of Tuesday's 716 close, they added 9,000 new shorts. Where's the market since last Tuesday? It's up, isn't it? Owie, owie, oxen free. I'm not saying that they're wrong in their assessment, their timing might be off, they may be underfunded, Right? But the moral of the story is if this position in this Friday will be as of Tuesday's close once again, and if by this Friday that number goes up again, baby, we got another leg higher coming in S&Ps. Because the technical, this, and this is how I put it together, this tells me there's ammunition for short covering. If no one's short, there's no short covering. Does that make sense? If my technical research, breadth is positive, volume is positive, price structure is positive, how much higher can it go? Well, if you have shorts in the market, I know they might get another goose because they have to cover those short positions. So then I start thinking, what would be that threshold of pain? So how much higher can we go? That's helping me maintain my net long position. And for the record, I am net long right now. Our fund is actually long. Uh, in SPXL, so that's how I feel about the market. I'm not just long spiders. I'm in leverage DTF on SPXL. That's where we stand. So this helps give me, maybe not the confidence, but tells me there's ammunition left in the market to rally. And if by Friday, if that number goes down, and this will be released at 3.30, for all you avid traders, who's an avid trader? Trades day in, day out, S&Ps. You ever notice on a Friday, right around 3.30, something jiggles the market a little bit? That report comes out at 3.30. Pretty cool, right? So if you wonder, what happened at 3.30? That report came out at 3.30. So when I look at my 12-step program and someone just says, well, I'll use this, this, this. Well, then how do you use it, person? So anyone that you come and see and they tell you about indicators and they want to teach you, just simply ask them, well, how do you use it to make money? And I definitively gave you a great way of using this. I wrote about that in my very first book because this is, there's a couple things that we would look for signs of a clue of either trend continuation or key reversals coming in the market. One key reversal is when the CME starts to raise the margin requirement. So when there's margin rate changes, when a trend of a market and the price keeps going up, 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 
When is the reversal coming? Well, when the CME announces that they are raising the margin requirement, that's signs of a reversal soon. So margin rate changes is one. Uh, you can obviously look at the AAII, the American Association of Individual Investors, and there's other con contrarian or consensus indicators. But the COT, I've just shared with you exactly how I use it and the content of which I use it for, for helping me to confirm trades, okay? So um, this is where I wanted to get into looking at a couple things about what helps me to define a trade. In the previous slide, I said there's types of signals. Bottom pattern with indicator convergences. What is a convergence? Some people call it positive divergence. George taught me to say positive or bullish convergence, and I'll teach you why in a minute. I don't know if there's a right way or a wrong way. I'm just showing you what I was taught and how I do it. But in a bullish market, if the price makes a secondary lower low, but an indicator makes a higher low. If you draw a support line off the bottom of the indicator, it's pointing up. If you draw a trend line off the low of the price, it's pointing down. And the two lines are doing what? Converging. So I call it bullish convergence and the opposite, when price makes a higher high and the indicator makes a lower high, they are diverging. So I call it bearish divergence, positive convergence. It's a matter of semantics. I'm not a fan of ADX. It seems to be resurging in popularity because a few educators have tried to regurgitate it and rename it and do whatever they do. It was created by Wells Wilder. It has some value. I don't find it efficient for my work or for my trading, okay? There's ADX, DMI plus minus. It's okay, but it's not as efficient of other things that I found, okay? But thank you for your, I don't want to tease you and say interruption, but thank you. All right, what I do use and what I have found efficient is I do believe volume is a very uh, structural part of our markets. Volume histogram should be thrown out and made illegal. I have no clue how to read it. I don't know what it's useful for is defining volume trends. An individual volume day, okay. I do compare today's volume with maybe a 10-day average of volume. So here's um, what isn't broken, but it locked up, but this is team viewer through my office, and you can tell I got multiple monitors up here, four of them. But I want to share with you, this is the kind of the headers that I like to look at. And I'll explain. This is the volume. Now, I can't switch the page. If I could show you my stock page, you would see every ETF, the top 20 ETFs. And then I break those ETFs into sectors with the top 10 or 15 stocks that I like to look at in each sector. All right? So if it's transportation, I have CSX, UNP. I got the delivery guys, UPS and, and FDX, that's FedEx. I got JetBlue. I got Save. I got Alaskan Airlines, which are the Discount Airlines is what I call them. You got Delta, American, and, uh, and, and United Airlines. So I've got JB uh, Hunt, JBHT, and CHRW Logistics. So in the transportation, those are the stocks would be in my listing for stocks and transportations. All right? And each of those stocks have the same column. What do the columns represent? What today's volume is versus the 10-day average volume. So I want to know what was not just yesterday, because yesterday could have been a holiday. The other day may have been a slow day. But what is the average of volume over the last 10 days, which represents what in daily terms? Two weeks. So I want to know, is today a big volume day, a little volume day? Compared to what? That's what we're doing. Comparisons. Relative strength is a comparison analysis. Making a good educated trading decision is something off comparing something to something else. A good volume day. What's a good volume day? Well, it was better than yesterday. Well, with yesterday, the market was closed. Anything's better than yesterday. So I look at the volume, and I'm just sharing with what I look at. If I see a stock down, and it's 40%, 50% greater than its 10-day average volume, that is not a fluke. Somebody liquidated the pants off of this thing. That is not buy the dip type situation. That's my first clue. How do I find that information? I'm comparing A, today's volume, to the over 10-day volume. 
Range. What is range? What is today's range? Is it a big range? I don't know. What, what, you know, uh, we got the S&Ps today. We had a 20.75, uh, let's just round down and say a 21-point range today. I know immediately that's, that's a sniveling little market range. In December, we had a 10-day average range of 96 points in the S&Ps. You guys knew that, right? 96 handles on average 10 days by before Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve. That was some brutal stuff, right? Yeah, I saved that one, didn't I? Like, I think that ship sailed. I don't need to save anything anymore, right? After that political joke thing, right? So I'm comparing what today's range is with what an average true range of 10 days. So I want to know what kind of volatility we are entering in. Why? Because if I'm, I'm creating an algo strategy and if I want to look at risk reward and if I want to look at points that I can make and points that I can risk, I can't develop a system for day trading that wants to make maybe 10 S&P points, which would be half of today's range on a five minute model. That might be difficult, but if I have a 96 point ATR and I'm only taking eight ticks out of the market, I'm a moron. Because I would probably have to risk about 1200 bucks to make those eight ticks. So volatility tells me what the trading environment is doing and I have to not adjust, not curve fit, but I have to do maintenance on a trading strategy and a trade system based on the fluctuation in the environment we're in. Forex was a big thing, yes or no, a few years back, or maybe five years now. Forex, right? Forex was a big deal. Forex traders are sucking eggs right now. Why? There's no volatility. The euro currency is at a historic low day trading range. Did you know that? Can't make money. Let's take a look. The euro currency right now 60, it's actually rising, I take that back, it's getting better. 64 ticks, it used to be 140. On average, it was about 89. Uh, two months ago, the ATR was 41 points a day. That's 24 hours. <laughs> trading, a day, trying to trade, day trade a market for 41 ticks is a tough way to make money in the biggest, baddest boy currency on the planet, the euro currency. So, identifying is there volatility, what is the current structure of the market, what does that mean? It means what is it today versus maybe the last 10 days. Now you can use an ATR of five days, 10 days, 20 days. The more time you use, the less sensitive it is and it averages it out. The shorter the time, the more sensitive. I like using 10 periods both for volume and ATR. This blinking stuff is just about what the pivot point analysis shows me. Is it in a bullish mode or a bearish mode? These daily signals is that PPS. Today we fired off a daily PPS buy mode in the E-mini S&P. So for those that are short, the algorithms that I created, which is what PPS indicator is, about 10 things have to happen in order to change or to put an arrow pointing up, which is a bullish momentum, or an arrow pointing down, which is bearish momentum. It's not a moving average crossover. There's a few things that have to happen in there. So it's a very powerful tool, and, and I de definitely want to give everyone a, a, a look-see. On Thinkorswim, they have an amazing function of their scan feature, and you can punch in a scan and use person's PPS study and say, scan how many stocks generated a daily buy signal. Now, think about the breadth of the market we talked about. Did that logically make sense? If the market's strong, more stocks will go up in the index than down. Did that make logical sense to everybody? So think of it this way. Oh, that's great. Maybe Apple was up a buck. Big deal. Maybe Illinois Toolwork, which had a great day today. But maybe Hewlett Packard was up four cents. Well, four cents doesn't float my boat. It could be down 50 cents tomorrow. But what if we run a scan, not just to tell me how the breadth of the market is, but how many stocks generated a momentum PPS buy signal in the S&P 500? Whoa. So that's telling me a lot of stuff happened for stocks to generate a buy, and that's telling me the market has had a what? Maybe a reversal and a shift in positive momentum. If it's on good volume, it also confirms the breadth is strong. I ain't taking day trades shorts tomorrow. I'll be looking for buy signals under that criteria. 
knowing that also today's move wasn't probably enough to shake out a lot of those shorts in the, that the public put on. And we were up 16, 17 points in the ES today, I think, right? It locked up, so I don't know what the actual last... We were up 16. Were we up 17? No one knows? Did it finally hit 20? So, um... I got, well, obviously I'm not connected to the Wi-Fi here, but um, yeah, 1308 up 19. So we're up in the after hours. So, all right, so that's nice. So you're up 20 points. It's a grand. So if you're short from, let's say, 86, the average of 86, take the midpoint of last week's range. From 86 to 20 handles is a grand. Is that enough to scare everyone out of their position? You're, you're upset, but you're not scared. It'd be my guess. So I'm thinking, what would be the threshold of pain if your average short, if it's $4,000, makes everyone nervous and, and pukes? So $4,000, you got maybe what? 60 points? That's going to cause a little bit of panic in the market on shorts. I'm not saying it's going to get there, but I'm certainly monitoring that. And now that is a part of reality in my mind. That's it. So... I want to look at what the participation, not just the strength of moves. So this is a small little company called Hormel. So Hormel, I always say it's man's college kid's best food. It's, it's the chili in the can, a couple beers and a can of this, and you're good at college. You go right through exams, right, kids? Maybe, you know, splurge with some premium crackers. You know, go to Wendy's, grab all you can. Man, you're living large, right? I mean, you don't want to go to class the next day and sit next to that guy, but I'm just saying, Hormel, look at classic convergence pattern. This is the PMC relative strength. And what we see is if market's making a new low in the individual stock compared to the relative strength, what the PMC for stock traders, this is a tool you have to your advantage. This, you cannot use this tool to use day trading e-mini S&Ps to the S&Ps, because this is taking the relative strength comparative percent change of value of an underlying stock comparing it to the S&P 500. So I can't compare strength of S&P 500 to S&P 500. It's going to be a blank line. Maybe the E-mini S&Ps because they trade overnight, but you're trading S&Ps to spiders. It's kind of tough to take a relative strength when you're comparing the... Do you follow me? I got a couple blank stares there. So I want to make sure I explain this because I don't want to, hey, this E-mini S&Ps, this relative strength thing sucks. It doesn't work. It works to compare a stock to an underlying or ETF to the underlying product, in this case, is the SPY. The way the PMC was created was a moving average function. It identifies the momentum of the strength or weakness. There's four colors because there's four stages of what we identify the market. Bright blue is starting to outperform the market. Dark blue is still outperforming the market, but it is weakening. Red is, well, red is bad if long. Red is lagging. And fuchsia color is improving. So when we get a price momentum indicator and volume is starting to creep into the market and the relative strength is showing a, a convergence or B, improving pattern. It's starting to show there's money flow going into that market. So with a bullish convergence, this is that specialized volume tool that trades and takes a look at the percent change of volume rather than volume in of itself. This is on balance volume. The reason I have this slide is to say for the tools that I use, I wanted to compare and share with you what is the difference between OBV? It's, a, it's okay, but this is a little bit better. And, but when you compare the relative strength, you get a definite picture that, man, there's some buying going on in here. And the relative strength is improving all the way, and then it goes, bang, it's outperforming the market. This is what the kind of patterns you're looking for, for that sweet, immediate price breakout. The inverse of this would be true for sell signals, bearish divergence. So, a couple little things about, you were talking about, and uh, someone asked me about ADX or DMI. 
the, we've only got a couple more minutes. Uh, Wells Wilder, who created several indicators, and he had it in his book uh, called, um, whatever it's called, Wells Wilder. I think he only had the one book. Uh, it's, it's, it's a white book. So he has uh, RSI, Relative Strength Index. That's what, it's a funny thing is, just a little history. Wells Wilder was a commodity trader and he created ATR to help differentiate gap moves in limit up and limit down moves in commodities. How's that for a little history lesson, all right? Next, he also used pivot analysis. And so the indicator of the tool that I created called person's pivots filters out the pivots based on a moving average function. If the market's deemed to be bullish, it's going to give us in the future, so based on today's close, it's going to tell me tomorrow the market condition is bullish. And it's going to project a support and a resistance targeting higher highs and higher lows. So I didn't invent pivots. Even Wells used it, but he never called them pivot points. He called it the trend reactionary system. Most people flipped right over that when they read the book. And if you have the book and you read it, you're probably like, yeah, I didn't remember that. Go look it up. But HLC divided by three right here, that is the pivot point formula. It's right here in this booklet. And this formula here is R1, and that formula there is R2. And it's right here in the book. Interesting. The problem with that, it had a lot of rules. It was inefficient. And uh, I mean, many people just, nah, it didn't work well. So it worked for him maybe. But he put a lot of tools out there that were efficient. And so, like I said, um, I don't use half of it, most of his stuff. But I do appreciate the ATR and that concept of ATR. And we use a little bit of ATR, and people use it for stops to move your stop away, your ATR times a, co a factor. Like if the ATR of a market is 10 points or 20 points in the S&Ps, and you went long the s ps and if you used a, an ATR function of maybe 30%, so you would have 20, 30% of 20 is 26, right? Fast math? So 26 points. So where you buy the s ps today, you'd put your stop 26 points below today's low. Oops. That's some good risk. True? But you're putting your stop well out of harm's way for your initial stop. So that was one method that people use, the ATR, in using stops. So you'll hear stuff like chandelier stops from Chuck LeBeau. You'll hear stuff like compression stops. Um, and that, that, that is a function of one of the works that uh, Wells Wilder did. I use pivots. It helps me to understand the relationship of the market. And it does a little bit better than the ATR in determining stops and market condition. So this is a, a chart on the utilities. And if at the end of the day, the market closes, and these, these are based off thinkorswim. So this here is a, a daily chart with monthly person's pivots on balance volume and the relative strength. So looking at the relative strength, you can clearly see that the market was making a newer high in the utilities against a major pivot red resistance. Can you see that right here? And is this high? greater than that prior peak swing high. Higher than here. Corresponding indicator is the relative strength higher than the same corresponding point of price. The relative strength reading is lower, correct? That is a divergence. I'm not just selecting any high to compare a prior high. I'm comparing the current high to the last swing high. Does that make sense? Does everyone understand what I, a swing high is, this is a reactionary high because there was a reaction because it went from that swing low to that high and made a subsequent low. And then it made another trend up. This is a swing high, the prior swing high. When the swing, secondary swing high is greater than the prior, but the relative strength is weakening, el no goodo, be careful. But clearly, you can see a PPS orange arrow points out that this is negative. The market closes below a monthly pivot, which is fuchsia. And the relative strength goes into owie, owie, oxenville, freeville world. I didn't even say that. It's owie, owie, oxen free, right? Owie, owie. If long, that's an owie, OK? So relative strength, and to, to formulate better trade ideas, the, the essence of today's presentation was to share with you what tools work for which markets, 
How do algo traders put together trades? Algos are simply criteria that we told the computer to say, generate this trade. It's up to us to know what our risk factor is. What are risk factors determined? By ATR, by distance of where the market was, by old support, and condition of the market. And I wanted to share with you what are the greatest tools that we have right now that are not new, but modernized. That's it. I didn't invent relative strength, but I created a tool to visualize them so that we understand four different cycles or phases of a market. Improving, weakening, lagging, and outperforming. We want to be, if long, in fuchsia to bright blue in a stock. So that's how we put things together, and that concludes our session together. Um, I thank you for joining us. I thank you for tolerating me. I'm just joking to make it a little bit humorous up here. Thank you all for the audience for uh, participating. If you want more information, you can find us at PersonsPlanet.com. We do have an advisory service. We run a live trading room. You saw the results of the live trading room right up in front of you. That projects every time there's a trade, the entry, the time, the price, the results. And you could watch that and see that in front of you. That's what we do. We also are in a management fund and that's a different subject for another day. So I thank you for attending. And now that we are concluded with this,